Sweet Sweetback, Shaft, Truck Turner, Charlie One Eye, The Mac, Willie Dino Might, Mean Johnny Barrel, Sweet Jesus. These, as paid tribute to by the Wires Clark Peters, are some of the superheroes of the black exploitation explosion, a boom of mostly low budget American movies in the 1970s featuring black performers for the first time kicking ass and sticking it to the man. Trouble man. Popcorn cinema shot fast and cheap. Black exploitation marked the first time black filmmakers made serious cash at the box office. Not everyone loved these stories of badassery. The NAACP gave the genre its name as a derogatory term, but the style and tone, slick, cool, violent and righteous, inspired generations of black artists to come. I love those movies. I mean, I love those movies, you know, for what they were at that period of time. That's John Singleton, director of Boys in the Hood. They were pretty much a lot of them pure entertainment because we were coming off of the late 60s, early 70s with, you know, the death of King and, and Malcolm X and the government destruction of the Black Panthers and, and the government destruction of a lot of hope. There's a lot of black entertainment that comes out in the early 70s because People were so upset, they felt that they had to assuage the, the frustration and the anger of, of a populace with entertaining them and calming them down, you know what I mean? But for better or worse, you know, that, you know some really great creative people came out of that time, you know, um, it was beautiful. From actors Richard Roundtree, aka Shaft, to Fred the Hammer Williamson, the black exploitation scene wasn't short of a charismatic figure or two. But there was one star who had a special magnetism. She stood out from the crowd. Have no fear, Pam Greer is here. When Foxy Brown comes to town, all the brothers gather round. Cause she can really shake them down. Foxy lady, Foxy lady. Pam Greer, that one chick hit squad who creamed you as coffee, is back to do a job on the mob as Foxy Brown. I'm Ashley Clark, programmer of the Black Star film season at London's BFI Southbank. The Black Star season is a nationwide celebration of the range, power and versatility of black actors. Over six weekly episodes, we're telling the stories of six black stars and looking at how they helped shape the landscape of Hollywood and the world beyond. Last week, we focused on Harry Belafonte, the legendary actor and singer who put his career on the line with his activism. This week, it's the turn of a star who rocked, socked, and shocked Hollywood and the world in a different way. The one, the only, the mighty Pam Greer. First time I saw you walk on by, you've got the look. The talk of the town and the queen of style, you've got the look. Pam Greer was born in 1949 in Winston Salem, North Carolina. She had an unorthodox upbringing. Her father was a mechanic in the Air Force, so the family moved around the US, back and forth across the Atlantic, on and off of military bases. Wherever she was, though, she was growing up in an era of unrest and political turmoil. I saw more violence in my neighborhood and in the war and on the newsreels than I did in my movies, Greer once told an interviewer. Coming from the 50s, things were very violent. We were still being lynched. If I drove down through the South with my mother, I might not make it through one state without being bullied or harassed. Well, it was a time of a lot of violence in the black world. That's Greer's biographer, Andrea Kagan, author of Foxy, My Life in Three Acts. But her mother showed her that all white people were not mean people. Somebody once picked them up in a bus. They weren't supposed to be riding in that bus. Black women weren't allowed in the bus or black people. And she was walking home with her daughters, in a, with her children, in a very, very warm day. And the bus stopped and, and let her on and let the kids on. And at the end of it, she said, see, all white people are not bad. Perhaps not in real life, but in black exploitation films, real world racism was reflected by the fiction. Whitey was often the baddie. You pink-ass, corrupt, honky judge. Take your little wet noodle out of here, and if you see a man anywhere, send him in, because I do need a man. Greer's first flirtation with showbiz was on the beauty pageant scene, which she entered to fund film school. Next, she found work operating the switchboard at a Hollywood agent's office. But things really started to take off when she got a gig working as an operator for the independent B-movie machine American International Pictures, a genre chop shop 
who since the 50s had been churning out fodder for that new lucrative audience, the teenager. Many of them probably snuck in to see an early Greer performance, a minor role in Russ Meyer's camp classic, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, released in 1970. It wasn't long before she was racking up the appearances in racy women in captivity sexploitation flicks. Just listen to these titles. The Big Dollhouse, Women in Cages, and The Big Bird Cage, for which the strapline says it all. Women so hot with desire, they melt the chains that enslave them. These are all films in which she was already working within the exploitation genre. That's Maya Mask, professor of film at Vassar College and author of Divas on Screen, Black Women in American Film. Films that were inexpensively made, you know, with an eye toward being somewhat sexually titillating, but, you know, pushing some of the boundaries or invoking some of the discourse around race relations, but really not in a substantive way. But that was her her break or, or her entry into the film industry. These films make it possible for her to then transition to the black exploitation films. Uh, some of the some of the tra- the bridge films are like Black Mama, White Mama, 1972, which is in some ways a spin on the Defiant ones with Sidney Poitier and Tony Curtis, or The Arena. Those are the two films that enable her to transition to the black exploitation films like Coffee, Foxy Brown, Friday Forster. As Maya points out. These early flicks were a bridge to something greater. Indelible crime-fighting heroines like Coffee in 1973 and 1974's Foxy Brown, where she plays, in the words of one character, a whole lot of woman, exuding sex appeal while destroying a procession of low-life male villains. But Greer's status as a sex symbol troubled her. She'd experienced terrible personal trauma in her early life, which, according to Andrea Kagan, forced her to link beauty and violence in her mind. She experienced two rapes in her life. One when she was very young, maybe eight or something like that. Then she, when she was 18, she was raped again by someone that her parents were really pushing her to go out with. So there was a part of her that feared that being beautiful, that it, what it did was it invited violence. Yet it was this combination, the beautiful woman who could brawl, the pretty girl who pulverized, that most appealed to the black exploitation audience. Foxy Brown and Coffee, black women who had no problem fighting injustice with physical violence, had a huge effect on popular culture and, according to Kagan, gave Greer a new lease of life too. She liked those characters because it was one of the first times that women, that black women really showed up in a place of power where she could end up winning in the end and she was fierce. And so it was very interesting to see her kind of move into that area where she was such this fierce, powerful woman who was not a bit afraid of violence. And the truth is that she's a a pacifist and a very non-violent human being. And so I think it was true acting. True acting, maybe. But cultural critic Greg Tate has a different take on what those roles meant in a political climate where activist groups like the Black Panthers were calling for radical solutions to America's racial problem. A reflection of Hollywood trying to domesticate how fearsome the Black Panther women were. The real Pam Greer, the real Kathleen Cleaver, the real Elaine Brown, because of what they were connected to, you know, was hella scary. The thing about those movies is they always end up clowning uh, the radicals, you know, as, as, as some kind of cliche. You know, so it's like, it's not like you see Pam Greer in those movies as an avatar of the Black Panther. But the idea of a black woman kind of occupying that space outside of black pulp cinema totally destabilized the whole notion of the, the white male of God. There's no doubt that Greer was breaking bold new ground in a way that no actress of any race had done before. A female action star, the top line credit, the main draw. Alongside Liza Minnelli and Barbara Streisand, Greer became one of only three women in the 1970s who could open a film. We should spare a thought here for Greer's contemporary, Tamara Dobson, who might have also claimed the crown. Coffee cut in front of Dobson's Cleopatra Jones by a matter of weeks and surpassed it at the box office. Coffee, baby. You gotta understand, I I thought you were dead. But Greer's stardom couldn't be sustained. Her career began to falter in line with the collapse of black exploitation 
which, argues Musk, became artistically bankrupt. Unfortunately, instead of uh, branching out beyond the themes and the production mode of black exploitation, they relied on it and just kind of, st the, they being the studio producers, relied on it and didn't actually take it as an opportunity to develop black cinema beyond that. So it didn't start out necessarily as something that was negative, but it ultimately reduced black film production to something very simplistic. In the late 1970s and 80s, Greer kept working, finding regular roles on stage and television. But this was some way away from the heights of her former stardom. After that moment of uh, investment in those films, she became you know, another working actress, working black actress in Hollywood, which meant that you're on the low end of the totem pole. That's Greg Tate. So it's this moment of glory where you step totally outside of uh, the cage to just be another black woman trying to keep the lights on. Think of Pam Greer's career as one that, you know, I, wouldn't, I don't want to use the term arrested development, but just did not blossom and flourish the way it could have after exploitation cinema. That was Maya Mask. The latter part of her career is one where there's kind of nostalgia for herself. And yet, there was something in the water in the 1990s. A sense that black exploitation, which had fallen well out of fashion long before the 80s had begun, was making something of a comeback. An explosion of so-called hood movies, like New Jack City, Menace to Society and Juice, not to mention the burgeoning gangster rap scene, Harked back unmistakably to black exploitation aesthetics. Tough guys, flash clothes, extreme violence. Hip hop was feeling it too. Rappers like Snoop Dogg and the Ghetto Boys swiped the style by throwing on fur and bulking up with bling. Most blatantly, the rapper Foxy Brown, born Inga de Carlo Marchand Funk, adopted Greer's character's name as her alias. Even the old timers were getting back on the horse. In 1996, Larry Cohen's original Gangsters reunited a host of black exploitation stars for a fun, if schlocky, romp. Richard Shaft Roundtree, Fred the Hammer Williamson, Ron Superfly O'Neill, and yes, Pam Greer. Get up! Uh, I'm gonna blow up in your face. Well, let's find out. Uh! Woman's intuition. Greer's true comeback, though, would arrive a year later, courtesy of a man who wasn't afraid of co-opting black culture. He happened to be one of the most talked about indie filmmakers of the decade too. So without any further ado, please welcome Quentin Tarantino. I started like thinking of who could be Jackie Brown and, and knowing that like the attributes that uh, she had to have and she had to look like she could handle anything. And then Pam just popped in my head. Pam's perfect. Pam is perfect for the role, all right? You know, she's, she's the exact right age, all right? Uh, you know, she looks younger, and uh, she looks like she can handle anything. And as well, by doing that, that kind of turns this into a Pam Greer movie, all right? And nothing wrong with that, all right? That sounds good, all right? It's like kind of a, it's a Pam Greer movie I'd like to see. Greer shone as the title character, a flight attendant who gets caught up in some nasty business with some truly unpleasant folks. Among them had passed his prime mobster, played by, who else? Robert De Niro, and a gun runner, played by Samuel L. Jackson. Is that what I think it is? What do you think it is? I think it's a gun pressed up against my dick. <laughs> well, you thought right. Now take your hands from around my throat. Jackie Brown, based on the book Rum Punch by Elmore Leonard, is often talked about as Tarantino's most mature film. An interesting quirk, given the proudly lowbrow roots of its source genre. Jackie Brown is a perfect example, again, of what I mean when I say a, there is a nostalgia for the earlier Pam Greer or the roles of Pam Greer. That was Maya Mask. The kind of respectful homage to her earlier screen persona. Uh, the irony about it being a kind of geeky white guy, that doesn't strike me as that unusual if we think about who has access to uh, the film industry and who can get films greenlit. There aren't as many people of color or women or women of color that actually have access 
to uh, be film directors. And so I think that if somebody was going to be, you know, uh, a fan and make films that were homages to the, her work, it was probably going to be somebody white, straight and male. Jackie Brown gave Greer a career boost. For her performance, she received a Golden Globe nomination. And off the back of the film, she landed some meatier roles, most notably a recurring part in highly rated TV drama The L Word. Tarantino's film was one of the first of many postmodern riffs on black exploitation, a genre that really got under the skin of future generations of filmmakers. Its sexy brashness was ripe for ironizing, but also just a whole lot of fun to revel in. Beyonce playing Foxy Cleopatra in Austin Powers' Gold Member. Pootie Tang, undercover brother. Tarantino at it again in Django Unchained. Netflix's recent smash TV series Luke Cage. And best of all, Scott Sanders' dead-on spoof Black Dynamite. Main man, Black Dynamite. He's super cool and he no kung fu. Drives a $5,000 car and wears a $100 suit. You're so righteous. This is also true. The Pomo black exploitation boom has mostly been a male thing, but maybe the biggest on screen inheritor of Greer's no nonsense attitude and sex appeal is Taraji P. Henson's mean, moody matriarch, Cookie Lion, in Lee Daniels' brash TV hip hop empire. What the hell is wrong with you agreeing to do some stupid summit? That bougie bitch, he wouldn't know the streets if it shot him in the ass. Here's Greg Tate then to wrap up on the mighty Pam's influence. When you talk about uh, Pam Greer and, and Tim Dobson, you're talking about breakthroughs in black female representation that haven't been repeated since. Black female superheroes dominating white and black men. That subgenre ends with Pam Greer. She occupies like a singular place. Occupies a singular space is a phrase that equally applies to the star of next week's podcast. A comedy legend, powerful dramatic force, and bona fide black megastar, Whoopi Goldberg. Hi all, Black Star producer Henry Barnes here with your credits for this week's episode. The Black Star podcast is co-written and hosted by Ashley Clark, co-written and produced by Henry Barnes, with additional production by Peter Sale. Special thanks to Lou Thomas this week for the additional interview material, and to Clark Peters for the super soulful opening. The Pam Greer episode of Black Star contains short clips from the following. Foxy Brown, directed by Jack Hill and released in 1974 by American International Pictures. Coffee, directed by Jack Hill and released in 1973 by American International Pictures. Original Gangsters, directed by Larry Cohen and released in 1996 by Orion Pictures. Jackie Brown, directed by Quentin Tarantino and released in 1997 by A Band Apart, Mighty Mighty Aphrodite Productions, Lawrence Bender Productions and Miramax. Black Dynamite, directed by Scott Sanders and released in 2009 by ARS Nova and Apparition. And a clip from the Fox TV show Empire, first broadcast in 2015 and released by Imagine Television, Lee Daniels Entertainment, Danny Strong Productions, Little Chicken Inc. and 20th Century Fox Television. That's your lot. See you for Whoopi next week. <laughs>